I'm gonna share some of our recent work in the space of neural software analysis, which is essentially just another way of saying LLMs or ML or AI um, for code. And in particular, I'll talk about uh, yeah, work on types, bugs, and executions. Um, as already said, if you wanna ask any questions, don't wait uh, until the end, just, just feel free to unmute and, and interrupt me at any point in time. Um, so fundamentally, what this work is about is uh, program analysis. And um, yeah, I mean, you all know what program analysis is. It's, it's yeah, techniques to analyze programs, either by uh, looking at the source code or by, by executing them. And the fundamental question um, behind any program analysis um, is how to actually create it. And until um, not too long ago, there was an answer to that and basically an answer, <laughs> not multiple, just one, which was, yeah, let's use traditional program analysis, which typically means that someone um, manually creates the analysis. Typically this takes a couple of years of work, for example, because that someone is doing this as part of their PhD. And the way these traditional program analyses work is um, by using precise and logical reasoning. So they basically know exactly how they reason about the program because everything is written down using some kind of logical rules. But typically this doesn't suffice to really get uh, an effective analysis. But in addition, um, uh, traditional program analysis also needs a lot of heuristics to, for example, handle the, the inherent undecidability of, of um, yeah, basically every program analysis pro problem. And another property of traditional analyses is that they are usually challenged by pretty large code bases. So more code um, is, is, is bad in a sense because um, they often don't scale very well to, to large code bases. Now this has changed a couple of years ago when uh, neural software analysis came along, um, which basically builds on this um, yeah, very interesting insight that there's a lot of data um, about software development that we can learn from. And if you combine all this data with the recent advances in machine learning, um, you can basically get these really interesting predictive tools that look at some data we have about software, in particular the source code, um, but also maybe execution traces or documentation, bug reports, or any, any, any other kind of artifact that is associated with the software itself. And then this data is given to um, some kind of machine learning. This could be a model you train from scratch, it could be a model you, you fine tune based on some already existing pre-trained model, or maybe it's a large language model that you just prompt in a few shot or maybe even zero shot uh, manner. And then what you get out of this is a predictive tool that if it looks at some new code or maybe some new executions or some new data point, is able to provide some information that is useful for developers. And I'll, I'll, I'll give examples of what I mean by information useful for developers um, throughout this talk. Before doing this, let me just contrast this um, neural software analysis with the traditional program analysis that we've already seen, um, because most of the properties are basically different. So one important difference is that a neural software analysis um, typically can be learned automatically, sometimes within hours, sometimes days, sometimes week if you really want weeks if you really want to train a model from scratch. Um, sometimes there isn't even any learning, right? If you just uh, prompt an LLM, um, there isn't really learning um, at the point in time when you, when you start to use the model. Um, instead of precise and logical reasoning, neural software analysis builds on data-driven prediction. So it's a completely different paradigm for, for basically deriving predictions about software. Um, another big difference is that um, the heur heuristics that are also really baked into the models um, are learned instead of hard coded. So, so it's, it's less on the human to find clever heuristics, but, but, but they are learned automatically from data. And last but not least, the perhaps uh, most interesting or most, most practically useful property of all of this is that a lot of code is actually a good thing because big code basically means a lot of data to learn from. So after this um, very general introduction, um, I want to go a little deeper into three pieces of work um, that um, yeah, we've been working on in my group recently. Um, the first one is on uh, fixing type errors in Python. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about um, some work on bug detection um, using neural networks. And finally, about some, some recent work on enabling execution, and we'll see what exactly that means. All right, so let's um, start with the first one, which is about fixing type errors in Python. And to motivate this work, um, let me start by looking at a typical evolution of a, of a Python project. So if you look at any Python project, very often you see the following pattern. 
Initially, someone writes some code, which typically does not have type annotations. And the reason is that people want to prototype fast and, and just write a Python code without really yeah, worrying too much about types or annotating types. Then at some point, the project grows. And over time, um, there is a need for adding type annotations. And what happens then is that um, people um, yeah, start to annotate some of the code by maybe adding parameter types or return types or maybe even variable types into the existing code. And there has been work, including by, by, by me and some collaborators, on um, predicting these types using neural models. So you do not have to do this by hand, but I'm not talking about this today. Now, when you add type annotations to existing code, one thing that might happen is that you actually get them wrong. And in the example you see here, there actually is a, is a type error. So if you look closely, um, you will probably see that um, this function is uh, annotated to return a Boolean. And it actually returns a Boolean on one path, but not on another path. So actually, what, what, um, what should be annotated here is that it's either a Boolean or none. And this is what you can then see in, uh, in a typical Python project after a while, where people basically fix the type error, in this case, by replacing the bool return type annotation by um, optional of bool. Um, now, this is how, how many projects evolve. And if you, if you look at um, a larger already existing Python code base that is somewhere between um, the second and the third um, stage in this, in this evolution, then what, you, what you'll find is that they have plenty of static type errors. So these type errors are pretty simple to detect because basically all you need to do is to run a gradual type checker like MyPy or maybe Pyre. Um, but the, 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 as a matter of fact, the developers are, are often uh, not able or willing or maybe just don't have enough time to really fix these, these static type errors. And what this means is that the, the gradual type checking um, yeah, becomes pretty, or is at least limited in its usefulness. Um, because you because you basically have a lot of type errors you see all the time, but and so you don't find the actually important ones. Now, to better understand these these type errors in uh, in real Python projects, we we ran a preliminary study where we basically looked at um, yeah a sub I mean some set of of, of such type errors, and um, the study led to to three interesting observations. The first one is that um, there are actually many recurring patterns. So if you look at how developers typically fix these type errors, you, you, you'll see the same patterns over and over again. But the, the problem is that there isn't really any ambiguous uh, rule you could, you could specify that says, OK, and for this kind of error, use this kind of um, transformation of the code, and then your type error goes away. So there are recurring patterns, but, but it's, not, it's not exactly clear when to apply what pattern. The second observation of our preliminary study is that most of the fixes um, are pretty local. So in many cases, it's just a single line that gets changed in order to get rid of, of a type error, um, which, is, which is nice because it means it, the fixes are maybe simple enough to, to automate. And then finally, the third observation we made is that um, the type checkers themselves are actually very useful at localizing where to apply a fix because they basically give you a line where you have to type error. Now, this does not have to be the location where you, where you um, yeah, fix the problem. But what we observed empirically is that most of the time it actually is. So motivated by these um, three um, observations, we've been working on a learning-based approach for fixing um, type errors in Python, which we call PyTy. So here's an overview of how PyTy works. And I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail um, for, for some of these uh, green boxes. But let me first go through. Um, the overview. So the input um, to PyTy is a, is a data set of commits that have already, um, um, yeah, that basically consists of um, code that has a type error and then the fix that gets rid of this type error. And then um, using uh, a combination of type checking and, and delta debugging, which I'll explain a little bit in more detail in on the next slide, um, we get a data set of isolated fixes that basically just show one fix of one type error at a time. And then we use this data set to fine tune an existing model. So it's a, it's a model that was already pre-trained on a different um, uh, program repair task. And we fine tune it now again to, um, to this task of fixing type errors in Python. And then the resulting model um, can then be given other code that um, has some type errors. And the model will suggest 
have fix or a potential fix to, to get rid of these type errors. And we, before showing them to the developer, we validate um, these candidate fixes through um, the type checker again. So we run uh, the gradual type checker like MyPy or Pyre. And if it gets rid of the one type error we, we've been targeting, then the fixed code is given to the developer. And otherwise, we just go back to the model and ask it again um, for another um, suggestion. So far, so good. If there are any questions at this point, um, yeah, feel free to interrupt me. Otherwise, I'll go into some more details um, about some of these boxes. I don't see any questions so far. So let me maybe move on and talk a little bit more about uh, how we gather this data set of um, isolated fixes. So this is basically a three-step process where we um, start with a keyword-based search for commits that are related to type errors and fixing them. So we have a couple of keywords like uh, fix, type error, mypy, and things like this that um, yeah, at least heuristically give us likely fixes for, for type errors. Um, now to, to focus on actual fixes of, of type errors, then the second step is to um, type check both the code before the commit and after the commit, so the old and the new code, which um, for this, for this um, evaluation gave us uh, 32,000 type errors that have been removed from uh, four and a half thousand different commits. So it's a relatively large data set of um, commits that somehow get rid of some type errors. And now, but what we really want to have is um, a code change that really focuses on just one particular instance of a type error, um, because we do not want to have, an, I mean, you very often find large commits that fix multiple type errors or maybe fix a type error and do lots of other things as well. Um, but we want to isolate um, individual fixes. So we, we do this um, using um, yeah, a combination of, of type checking and, and delta debugging. And at the end, then get 2.8 thousand isolated type error fixes. Let me illustrate this um, data gathering and in particular the third step um, on an example, which is um, about a commit where the code that you see on the left um, was changed into the code that was seen on the right. So what you see here is not all the code, but it's basically just the lines or hunks that are, um, that, that are, that are changed. So there's more code in, in, in between. The old code, as you see it, um, had a type error, um, which was basically complaining about using an unbound name base string. And then in the in the fixed in the new code, this type error somehow went away. So now the question is which parts of um, this code change, so which of the four hunks um, that are that are changed here um, should be should be considered to be relevant for the for fixing this type error. And to do this, we basically apply um, this, this idea of delta debugging, where we start with the entire change and then try to reduce it step by step in order to find what's really needed to address this one particular type error. So in this case, we would basically start with the entire commit and would see that, yes, if we um, check the old code, there's the error. If we check the new code, the error goes away. So this could be our isolated change. But we can also break it down by basically looking just at a subset of those hunks. In this case, if you, for example, just focus on hunk three and hunk four, then suddenly this particular type error is not going away anymore because you don't change the right code location. But if we uh, focus on hunk one and hunk two, then actually the, the type error goes away. So we try to um, yeah, reduce it even further and look at, uh, for example, just hunk two in isolation, which again is not a good one because it uh, doesn't get rid of the type error. But in contrast, hunk one alone um, gets rid of the unbound name base string type error, essentially because the developer is replacing base string with another um, yeah, variable or, or object in this case, um, which, is, um, which is then um, yeah, fixing the error. And so we, we do basically this, this data debugging um, based uh, reduction to always find the minimal set of hunks that um, address exactly one, one error. All right, so this gives us a data set. Um, now let me tell you a little bit more about the model. So the model that we are using here is a sequence to sequence model. So it's basically transforming a sequence of tokens into another sequence of tokens. Um, we um, start from um, an existing uh, model uh, presented in a work on TFIX, which itself is based on uh, the T5 model. So basically we are fine tuning an already fine tuned model for this particular task. And the input given to the to the model is essentially the erroneous code together with some um, context information. 
Um, there's a question in the chat whether we only use the 2.8 thousand type error fixes to for the for fine tuning and yes the answer is yes so we use exactly those um, actually um, I think 90 or 95 percent of them because we keep some for for validation um, but yes it's a relatively small um, data set of of type error fixes and the reason why this works is that yeah the task is pretty repetitive so after a couple of thousands of examples um, the model has basically seen enough. And the other reason is that tfix and t5 are already pre-trained on code and on a code transformation task um, so the model can can basically leverage that that knowledge um okay so let me um go into some more detail um okay i'll, I'll finish this slide and then i ask i answer the, the next question um so so the, yeah i'll go into some more detail of how the um, how the model input looks like. So it's basically a concatenation of, um, of a couple of different um, yeah, strings. The first one is just fix, so the English word fix. And then we have the, the kind of type error, which could, for example, be unborn variable. Um, then we have uh, M, the error message, so, so the, the exact message that we get from the, from the type checker, followed by the specific line on which this type error occurs. And then um, we have the, the actual code that has the, the, uh, the type error. And, and the code here is not just the line, but also the, the surrounding lines um, so that we, uh, yeah, we always look at the entire hunk. And then given this sequence of, um, of, of tokens, the model predicts another sequence of tokens, which is then the fixed code. So we replace um, code C with code C prime and then um, get, hopefully get rid of the type error. Um, there was another question in the chat. Uh, was there any manual commit analysis involved in filtering those commits? And the answer is no. So we have a few more filters that I didn't um, mention here. One is based on size. So we uh, ignored hunks that um, basically exceed the, the input token sequence length of, of the model we are using. Um, but there was, no, there was no manual filtering at all. What we did do, um, is, is to actually validate the data set. So, so in the paper, we have some, uh, yeah, some, some, some evaluation of, of how often this process of, of Delta debugging combined with type checking actually finds uh, the minimal and, and uh, correct fix. And, and what we find is, so I forget the number, but we find that in, in, the, in the large majority of cases, it's, it's what we want to find. It's not perfect, um, but in most cases, um, it finds what we wanted to find. Okay, there's another question. Sometimes fixing one type error can cause new type errors to appear. How does the data collection code handle situations like this? So we so we we only consider a type error to disappear if um, a there's no new error that appears. Um, so we do not include um, code changes where one error goes away and another one comes up. And um, and we also make sure that um, yeah the, the error that we are targeting really disappears. So by basically mapping the line numbers and making sure that it's the same error kind and the same uh, same error message. Yeah, good question. Good. Um, okay, so now you know a little bit about the the approach. Let me um, show you some uh, some results by looking at the effectiveness of uh, PyTy. So what you see in this um, table is uh, basically the different uh, classes of, of errors that, um, that we are addressing. So those are, it's a subset of everything that um, the type checker can find. Um, it's basically the subset that, that we found to occur in practice. And then what you, what you see in the, um, in the different columns is uh, this, the, the, how often they, they um, appear. So the, the first number is the number of training examples, and the second number is the number of test examples. And then the last two columns are about the effectiveness of, of PyTy measured in one of two ways. So the first one is to um, just uh, look at whether the error gets removed, which means it's probably the right fix, but we can say for sure, because um, yeah, sometimes you can get rid of an error in a way that is not what you really want. And then the second one um, is uh, looking for an exact match to the known developer fix. So basically how often um, PyTy finds exactly the fix that the actual developers also applied. So what you can see is that, yeah, across the board, it, 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 works, it works pretty well. So on average, um, yeah, for 85% for um, of the cases, it um, can remove the error. And for 54% of the cases, it, it finds exactly the, the error that um, yeah, uh, oh, oh, sorry, exactly the fix that the developers also applied. 
So let me show you <clears throat> two examples um, for each of these cases. Um, the first one is a case where PyTile finds exactly the developer fix. So at the top, um, you see the code um, that has a, has a type error. And without understanding all of this code, um, the problem is basically that um, the code is using this unbound name constraint. And what the developer wanted to use um, is constraint. Um, so it's a basically a, a small typo, but um, yeah. Um, and and PyTy finds exactly that fix, and it's it's um, it's the fix that the developers also used. As a second example, um, let's look at this one where PyTy finds a valid fix, and it's a fix that gets rid of the type error, but it's not exactly the one that the developers um, were using, but it's actually semantically equivalent. So the problem here, um, as shown on the top is that um, this string variable is uh, declared to have type um, well, string or str in Python. Um, but then this underscore FMT method is returning um, a value of a different type, namely bytes. And that um, gives, gives a type error at the, at the first line um, because yeah, the, the declared type is string, but then it's used as if it was of type bytes. And then in order to fix it, you somehow have to um, avoid assigning the bytes value to the string variables. And one way to do this, and this is what PyTy is doing, is to just use a different variable. Um, in this case, PyTy suggests to use a variable called byte string, which is then for consistency also changed down here. And what the developers did instead is to just um, put this call as a call expression directly into, in, into this argument. Um, which is semantically equivalent. Um, and yeah, you can argue which one is, is the better fix, but, but uh, at the end, they basically do the same. All right, so there's another question. How do you regularize the fixes? Why does the model not fix all the types to any or similar general type? Oh, interesting question. Um, basically because we fine tune the model on, on real developer fixes. So, so if we would, um, yeah, to, just just, try random transformations of the code um, that, that get rid of the type error, then maybe yeah, we, we would end up with just um, annotating everything as any, which also gets rid of the type errors. Um, but this is not what developers in practice are doing. So the, 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 the fixes we use as the training data um, make sense. And that's why the model then also picks up how to, how to fix the bugs in a way that yeah, sort of makes sense and does not just annotate everything with any. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's all I want to say about fixing type errors in Python. If you have more questions on this, um, feel free to, to ask. Otherwise, I would go on and talk a little bit about uh, neural bug detection. So let's do that. Um, and let me start with, uh, with an example where, um, as you can guess from what I said before, there's a bug. And maybe someone can, can actually guess what the bug is. One of these nasty bugs where a lot of people just stare at it for a while and just don't see it because your brain is uh, auto-correcting <laughs> the problem, but there is something wrong. What about the wrapping? The wrapping? The string wrapping. Oh, this one? The line after the raise. Can uh, you just like take yeah. a new line without having a backslash or something i think it's only for the slide but if you yeah, take this no, and run it you're in. right no no yeah right. I mean, this is only for the slide so so imagine this is a an auto wrapping editor <laughs> um yeah um so someone in the in the chat guesses it's the parentheses uh no that's also not it okay let, let me tell you um uh, it's actually pretty simple and once i tell you you'll say ah um so the problem here is that the condition is always true so the length of bits, whatever bits is, is either not four or not six, right? So with an or, this always evaluates to true. And this in particular means that it doesn't really match the message that is, uh, that is printed in this exception, but actually what happens is it, it always raises this exception whenever it's, it reaches this line. 
Um, here's a second example, which um, essentially falls in the same uh, kind of pattern. Um, so what the condition here is checking that is checking that n2 is larger than n1, and then in case the branch is taken, the code is uh, printing a message that is saying, hey, n2 is smaller than n1, that's not good. So it's, it's actually um, the opposite that is, that is printed um, as opposed to what, is, to what is checked. And the kind of um, uh, underlying bug pattern that you see here is an inconsistency between a condition and a message that is um, emitted once the condition is true. So now what we want to do in this work, uh, which is called CMI Finder, is to automati automatically detect these condition message uh, inconsistencies. So now, first of all, let me tell you why this is a practically interesting problem. Um, it's, it's basically because you really want the condition and the message to be consistent, because if you have an um, incorrect condition, then it may actually raise unnecessary warnings or maybe suppress warnings that, that, should, be, um, that should be printed or maybe exceptions that should be raised. And um, the other way around, if you have an incorrect message, um, it's also pretty bad because these messages typically play a role once you um, have a problem and want to debug the code. But if the message is actually uh, different from what the actual code is doing, um, this is not very helpful. And now um, from this practical perspective, um, um, in addition, uh, it's also an interesting problem uh, for, for research because it's a pretty hard problem as it requires you to understand both the natural language in the message and the semantics of the, of the programming language. All right, so let's see how we, how we can address this problem. And um, to do this, I'll show you an overview first of um, the CMI finder technique. So it's a, it's a learning-based approach, um, not using LLMs yet, which is why we basically have these um, two um, parts, a training phase that is shown on the left and then a prediction phase that is shown on the right. The input is a corpus of code, in this case in Python, but the language doesn't matter that much. And from this code corpus, we extract some data, um, namely the pairs of a condition and, and a message. And then we will consider um, all the pairs that basically just go down here, this arrow, as, the, um, as, as most likely correct. And in order to also get some negative examples to contrast them with, we automatically generate um, inconsistent examples. So this is what um, this box is doing here. And we actually have six different strategies for doing this, uh, out of which I'll show you a few. And then um, given these two kinds of examples, consistent and inconsistent pairs of messages and conditions, we pre-process and embed them and then train a neural model that is basically acting as a classifier um, to distinguish these two kinds of um, examples. And then once um, the model is trained, we enter the, the prediction phase where we get some new code to analyze, again, extract the message condition pairs, uh, pre-process and embed them in exactly the same way, and then ask the model, hey, do you think this is a consistent or an inconsistent example? And if the model predicts inconsistent, then we report a warning about an inconsistency um, to the developer. All right, let me go into a bit more detail um, for some of these steps. And in particular, um, I think the, the way how we generate inconsistent examples is, is important and, and interesting here. So let me um, tell you about uh, some of these uh, generation strategies. So some of them are, are basically what you what you what you would maybe expect. Um, so we use some uh, tra traditional mutation operators, for example. But then there are also some that are that are a little bit more interesting. So one of them is um, similar to mutation operators, but applied to natural language, um, and we use them to mutate the error messages. So for example, if there is a warning um, talking about invalid status then we replace it um, with valid status by basically yeah, replacing one word with, with its opposite. Another um, strategy is based on token embeddings. So what we do here is to um, look at individual tokens in the code, for example, this um, type arrow token up here, and then we mask it out and ask um, a model to predict another token that has a very similar embedding, um, which in this case um, would, for example, be value arrow. And if you look at the code, this actually gives you an inconsistency because if you if you check for a type with this, this instance, then you should raise a type error and not a value error. And finally, the, the last technique is using um, a language model um, to generate um, realistic but ultimately wrong um, error messages. Um, so we do this by um, mutating the conditions and then asking the, the language model, in this case, this was Codex, 
um, to basically predict the message given the incorrect condition. And then we mix um, the conditions and the messages um, so that um, we, we get uh, some that uh, don't fit to each other. So for example, we would replace um, the operator um, as you can see here, and then um, get another message, which is somewhat plausible and natural, but, but ultimately wrong. All right, so given this um, data generation, um, uh, the, these strategies, um, we can then um, again um, train a model. So again, we use uh, fine tuning here. I guess you could um, now with, with um, yeah, LLMs uh, also do something similar with LLMs and, and put, put some of these examples into a prompt. But uh, so when we did this, um, we used fine tuning. Um, and the model we fine tuned is uh, code T5. And essentially, um, the input and output is, is, is very straightforward. So we basically uh, tokenize the condition and also tokenize the message, concatenate it to, and, um, and, and then let the model either predict consistent or inconsistent. And it turns out this, this pretty simple way of addressing this problem uh, works very well. Um, um, and I think one of the reasons is that Code T5 is already pre-trained on a lot of code. So it, it has a lot of general understanding of code, um, which our model can build on. We've also tried a few other um, ways of addressing this. Um, one was to train a binary classifier just for this task. And yet another one was uh, using contrastive learning. And what we find and show in the paper is that um, this Code T5-based model works uh, clearly better. All right, let me talk a bit about the evaluation. Um, so to uh, gather training data, we uh, uh, automatically analyzed 40,000 Python projects and extracted uh, around 300,000 pairs of consistent and another 300,000 pairs of inconsistent um, messages and conditions. And then we evaluated this um, in uh, two different ways. The first one is um, on a data set of past uh, fixes of condition message inconsistencies. So we basically um, went through the history of a couple of projects and uh, looked for fixes that address exactly this, this problem. And we found uh, 33 of such fixes and then used the, the old buggy version as something the model hopefully finds to be inconsistent and the new fixed version as something the model hopefully finds to be uh, consistent. And then in addition, we also looked into uh, seven previously unseen Python projects to basically evaluate how well this works in, in, a, in a real life scenario where um, you just run this on a new project and want to find some, some new inconsistencies in there. So in terms of results, um, if you look at the, the area under curve of the classifier, um, so basically what we do here is we, we measure precision and recall because there's always a, a threshold you can, you can apply to decide whether you report an inconsistency or not. And then depending on this um, threshold, you get yeah, some precision and some recall. Um, and if you, if you plot a curve, um, uh, of this, you can measure the area under curve where higher is better. And what we find is that um, on the synthetic data, um, the model gets 91% uh, um, or 0.91 is the area under curve. And on the real world data, it's still pretty high with uh, 0.82. Um, so for example, this means 78% um, yeah, precision and 72% recall on the, on the data set of historic fixes. We also looked into yeah, these previously unseen projects and um, basically went through the inconsistencies reported by uh, CMI Finder um, until we had found 50 new uh, inconsistencies, many of which we have uh, created pull requests for and the developers accepted many of those. Um, in the paper, I won't talk about this in detail, we also have a comparison with um, Flake 8, so a traditional lint-like static analysis and also with a GPT-3 baseline. And uh, what we find for both of them is that uh, CMI finder is complementary to them. So it, it just finds different problems. Um, um, so it adds some value to, um, to a developer. Good. Um, <clears throat> so that's what I want to say about neural bug detection. If there are any questions on this part, um, yeah, feel free to, to ask. Otherwise, I'll um, move on to the third part, which is about yeah, Lexicuter. Um, and this is a technique for enabling execution. So to motivate um, this work on Lexicuter, um, imagine that you want to execute this, this code. What do you think would happen if you execute this code? So 
probably if you look at this code that long, you're basically doing um, what a computer cannot do, which is to fill in some missing pieces of information, right? Because the first thing that will happen is that this code crashes on the first line because it's trying to read a variable called all data that is not defined anywhere, right? So if I just have this code and want to execute it, it, it just doesn't work. And then even if you had this variable, um, there is of course a missing function, has min size. And even if you had that, you would get stuck here where the code is trying to read this other variable config string. Or if you even had that, you would basically get stuck here because you're trying to yeah, call some method on an import that actually is not part of the code. Um, now you may wonder, hmm, okay, why, why should I execute incomplete code? And um, the reason is that um, if you could, it would actually enable a lot of dynamic analysis. So, so once you go from static analysis to dynamic analysis, you basically have a lot more um, power because you can uh, look at a precise execution and, and, and find out um, about some properties of the code in a much more precise way than, than you could with uh, static uh, analysis. So for example, um, you can check code for, for exceptions or maybe um, violations of assertions or you could um, compare two different code snippets for semantic equivalence. So if you can execute both and find that they behave differently for the same input, um, you know that they are not semantically um, equivalent. Um, you could also use it, for example, to validate static analysis warnings. So a lot of static analyses have uh, many false positives. And if you would execute the code, you could basically check if the potential problems are, are actual problems. Or you could also use this to validate and filter code that is predicted by a large language model, um, which typically happens in a context where you're not able to just execute the code, um, but you may still want to validate um, the code for, for obvious uh, mistakes. Um, and there are many, many more applications. So if you've ever worked on dynamic analysis, you can probably easily fill in another one um, into this list. Now, the problem is that um, execution isn't, isn't really easy, right? If you, if you think about it, um, there's a lot of code that either is inherently in incomplete or maybe just difficult to, to set up and run. So in the uh, inherently incomplete uh, camp, um, there are, for example, code snippets you may find uh, in documentation or on, on Stack Overflow which um, yeah, typically um, do not come with all the context to, to really execute it. Um, another example is yeah, such a set code generated by language models. So any kind of code completion model um, um, yeah, often does not have the entire project ready to run, but, but basically just has um, the local context. And, um, and so, so you can just execute the code usually. And finally, um, even if you have code that is part of a, of a project and in principle you can execute it by, by using this project in its intended manner, um, it may be difficult to do this in practice because you oftentimes do not have test cases that really go um, at the right location inside um, a very uh, complex project. So now the, the question we were wondering about is whether you can basically automatically fill in some of the missing information in a way that is similar to what you may have just done when, when I've shown you this, this code example and asked, hey, what does this, what happens if you execute this code? And this is what Lexicutor is doing. So it's a learning guided approach for executing arbitrary code snippets, which basically works um, in the following. So whenever, um, a value is missing in the in the program execution, we ask a neural model for a plausible value that we could use. And then we inject this value into the execution. So in, in, this, in this manner, the executor is essentially um, making code execute even if it usually would not execute. And what you get by doing this is a form of um, under constraint execution. So there's, there's no guarantee um, that all the values we are injecting are realistic or real. Um, but as I'll show you, in most cases, the model is actually right because these models are pretty good at guessing um, plausible values um, in, in arbitrary programs. So let me get back to the um, example I've shown before and let's just execute um, this, this example. So the first problem um, we are facing here, as I said, is this uh, missing all data variable. And what Lexicutor will do is um, to look at the surrounding code and, and then predict that most likely this is a non-empty list. So what we'll do is um, we'll inject a value that yeah, is a non-empty list and then the code keeps running. Next, the code tries to call this has min size function, which of course doesn't exist, um, but we again ask the model and the model will tell us um, that yeah, most likely this function 
returns true. So we inject this value true and then, and then keep going. And then the next few lines um, are just executed without any help until we reach this um, read of config string, which based on the model and probably a human would give you a similar prediction um, is a non-empty string. And then finally, we have these two calls um, of this call of logger.info, where again, um, we ask the model and the model predicts that logger is an object, info is a method, and that this method in this case doesn't return anything. So essentially what this allows us is to, is to execute the code uh, without really having all the, all the contextual information. Let me show you how this works. And again, um, this is a learning-based approach. So we have a, a training phase here on the left and a prediction phase on the right. Um, during the training, we start from, from some executable code. So to do this, we need some code that really executes and um, we, we use test suites of existing open source projects for this purpose. Um, then we instrument this code. Um, and then uh, what the instrumented code does is uh, to uh, extract pairs of context, context and values uh, during the execution. So basically, whenever a value is used, um, we are extracting um, this value and the code context in which the value occurs. And then we use this, uh, this set of pairs um, to train a model. And then once we have the model, we can enter the prediction phase where we get some new code to execute, which is code that usually would not execute because we do not have it set up in a nice way and have all the inputs. Um, but now we make it execute by again instrumenting it so that um, at runtime, whenever the code is missing some value, we can ask the model for a plausible value and then get, get a likely runtime value that we inject into the running program. Let me show you um, in some more detail the, the neural model. Um, so at a very high level, the model um, takes code context as an input and then predicts um, some value. And in some more detail, um, the, the input looks like this. So the, the first part of the input um, is um, the name um, that is used to refer to the value because this name, for example, a variable name is a very helpful piece of information to guess the value. Then we have a special um, separator token followed by um, information about what kind of value this is. So whether it's a variable or an attribute or maybe the return value of a function. And then we have um, the code before and after the place where the value is used. And in the middle, we have a special mask token. I see two questions. Let me finish the slide and then I'll take them. And then on the output side, um, what we uh, use here is, um, yeah, uh, some, so basically what we need is some representation of, of a value. Um, so the way we, we solve this for now is to have um, a, a hand designed uh, set of uh, abstractions of concrete values, um, where we basically keep a few values around just as they are, in particular none and true and false and, and some other primitives. Then for integers, for example, we abstract them into negative, zero, or positive. And then for, for lists and, and other collections, we uh, uh, represent them as empty or non-empty. Um, and then, yeah, we also have a representation for a callable, so basically a function or anything else you can call in, in Python. All right, let me take a few questions from the from the chat. Um, so yeah, one question is, it seems like Lexicutor assumes the most likely value for each missing value and thus will run the successful path of the program. Are there ways to encourage it to explore edge cases of the program? Oh yeah, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, you're right, because the model is trained to predict um, a likely value. What you in most cases get is basically a success path. Um, but um, so we have different variants of of, um, uh, of Lexicutor. And one thing you can, for example, do is to sample from the top K predictions of values, um, which will allow you to basically yeah, um, also take some other path. And what you could also do, so we haven't done this yet, is to is to use values that are um, a, a, well that are unlikely according to the model. So it's sort of the opposite of what Lexicutor is doing, but it would be very easy to implement because you basically just need to yeah, uh, yeah, do one minus probability and then you, you get this. Um, there's another question. To what extent can this model uh, method be generalized for test-driven development um, instead of writing the actual uh, logic and tests, uh, let the model generate the rest? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, um, that's a good question. So yeah, I think that's, a, I think that's an obvious next step that we actually plan to take. So basically, 
Um, so you can think of Lexicutor as a form of automatic mocking, right? Where basically instead of writing these mocks by hand, they are they are generated for you. And and I think this is this is probably what 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 you're also um, yeah referring to here. Um, and then there's a third question. I'm thinking about future work. This approach could be a great way to understand the notion of similarity between two given code snippets during the execution process. Um, yep, yep, that's a that's a very good point. Um, so yeah, that's that's um, related to this potential application I mentioned before about um, yeah checking for semantic equivalence. But but yeah, you can extend this idea of course to yeah similarity between two code snippets. And basically, if you execute them with different values, and the more they behave the same, the the, the more similar they are. That's a that's a good idea. Okay, let me talk a little bit about the model before wrapping up. So the um, um, yeah model here is again a, a pre-trained and then fine-tuned Code T5 model. Um, just that um, yeah now we train it with the with the training data that I've just explained, and then once the model is trained, um, we basically intercept every use of a value in in the program we would like to execute. And then um, either just read this value if it actually exists, we just return it, wonderful. And if it is undefined, so usually the code would crash, then and only then we query the model and um, then return the prediction uh, made by the model and inject this predicted value into the execution. Let me briefly mention um, our um, evaluation. So we uh, trained this on a bit more than 200,000 uh, uh, pairs of uh, a value and the context in which the value is used, and then apply it to two different kinds of code snippets. Um, the first one is functions extracted from uh, open source projects. So we basically take a complex project and assume that we would like to execute one particular function. Which is which is hard in practice because usually you need a lot of input and a lot of context to actually reach this function, but we just take this one function and then try to execute it with Lexicutor. And the second scenario is um, code snippets from Stack Overflow, where we basically gathered yeah a set of syntactically correct code snippets in some Python related questions. Um, so we know the syntax is fine, but um, that doesn't mean that it's easy to execute those code snippets. In most cases, actually, it's it's very hard to to execute it. And then we see how successful Lexicutor is um, in executing those code snippets. So just to give you a glimpse of the results, so the um, accuracy of the model um, ranges between 80% and 94%, depending on whether you just look at the top one prediction or go down um, to maybe the top five predictions. And then at the bottom here of this, of this slide, what you can see is um, how many of all lines in a given piece of code um, you can actually successfully execute um, either with Lexicutor or with some baselines. So the first three entries here um, are different variants of Lexicutor. Um, and what you see is that it, um, yeah, in the mean can can execute uh, roughly half of the um, of the lines. Um, note that the goal here is not necessarily 100% because many programs have branches and in a typical execution of a code snippet, you would maybe take one branch, but not the other. So it's okay to not, to not reach 100%. And then the other <coughs> um, uh, approaches you see down here are basically two kinds. One is um, um, a variant of Lexicutor without actually using a neural model where we, for example, um, just inject values at random. Um, so by just taking these different kinds of values, we, we are able to inject and then just randomly pick one of them. And then uh, the last two entries here are two um, state-of-the-art approaches. The first one is a test generator for Python, um, Penguin or Penguin, um, which um, we ask to generate tests for the, for the given code snippet. Um, and finally, the as-is execution, which basically means that we just take the code snippet and try to run it which very often means it will crash on the first line because something is missing, but sometimes it actually reaches a little further than that. But overall, what you can see here is that with Lexicutor, you can execute a lot more code than with any of the other approaches. All right. Um, yeah, looking at the time, let me just show you one final example um, of uh, Lexicutor in action, which is um, yeah, a snippet we found on Stack Overflow. Um, which if you look at it, I mean, you get an idea what it's doing because you basically mentally fill in some value and um, uh, Lexicutor is doing the same. So for example, um, it will predict that PLT is an object and that figure is some method that doesn't return anything here. 
And, and by doing this, um, we are able to execute this code um, until the last line where it actually crashes um, because the way this code um, tries to um, uh, uh, yeah, index this uh, uh, value X is incorrect because the um, yeah the uh, indices um, need to be uh, need to be integers, but but cannot really be a tuple. At least if X is is a normal Python array, so this works for NumPy arrays. So 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 there's a hidden assumption maybe that X is a NumPy array, um, but this was not obvious from the from the Stack Overflow um, code snippets. Good. Um, let me maybe wrap this up by just um, yeah, reaching a summary. And yeah, with this, I'm um, yeah, happy to take any more questions and thank you a lot for your attention. Yeah, if you, you already had a lot of questions, but um, if you uh, want to ask more, either type them into the chat or maybe just unmute and, and talk. Oh yeah, so there's a question about uh, risks from executing arbitrary code with Lexicutor. And um, yes, you're right. <laughs> the answer is Docker. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you if you if you just download arbitrary code from uh, Stack Overflow and and projects, um, yeah, there's a bit of a risk that you uh, wipe your disk, <laughs> which is not what we want typically. So yeah, you should you should use Lexicutor in combination with some form of um, um, sandboxing, for example, Docker. Um, yeah, there's another question. Do you think the code T5 model can be used for um, more complex scenarios like optimizations? I, I, I definitely think so, yeah. So, so we've used it now for, for two different tasks and I'm aware of other papers that have used code T5 for, for other tasks. So it, seem, it seems pretty powerful. And I think the same holds for other pre-trained um, models that, that basically have learned a lot of um, yeah, general properties of code, but but yeah, I think if you if you have the right training data set or fine tuning data set, you can fine tune it. For example, also for yeah, you know, automatically applying optimizations or any other kinds of uh, code changes. What's nice about Code T five um, compared to many of the the really large language models that that um, we are also using, but in, in some other work is that you can actually run it locally, right? So. Um, with the LLMs from commercial providers, you are um, you're always at risk of of not being able to access the model tomorrow, uh, which cannot really happen with um, with a model you have you have uh, on one of your own machines. And Core T5 typically fits into the GPUs that you find in research labs. Yeah. 